Um, so Space Ape Games are a mobile game development company. Uh, we're probably most well known for our game Samurai Siege, uh, which is featured in the Apple App Store this month, I believe. Um, we have millions of players. We have tens of thousands of those playing concurrently. Uh, and we're entirely based around Amazon and its associated services. Um, our technology stack is Scala on the JVM, Redis and DynamoDB, uh, with a whole bunch of peripheral tooling around that. So why the hell should you listen to me on this topic? Um, I used to work for EA Playfish, who were a large social gaming company. Uh, we undertook a very big chef project there. Uh, we had many thousands of instances. Uh, the Chef project was described by OpsCode, who have now changed their name to Chef, uh, as one of the most sophisticated in, the, in Europe, I believe. Um, and I'm also, the, and this is the thing I'm most proud of in my career, the author of the world's first and only pure S390 assembler, Astrological Prediction Engine, which is a fact. If you have got access to the, um, should you ever find yourself with access to the uh, core uh, accounting system code repository for the Royal Bank of Scotland, and you look at Y001, we star, you will find a JCL deck and a bunch of object code that enables you to use a multi-million pound mainframe to predict a load of nonsense. Um, so most of this talk is going to involve me telling you a load of lies. Uh, the lies I'm going to tell you is that my job is to run a game. My job is not to run a game. I'm not in charge and there is no sort of top-down management. My job is to let the developers who own the game run the game and to make everything else that they're not concerned with get out of their way so they can go and do their job. Um, we're absolutely petrified of change, but of course we're not, because if there's one thing certain in any online service, and particularly in mobile gaming, particularly in, particularly in rapidly iterating mobile gaming, is that things are going to have to change all of the time. That is, that is a fact, there's no arguing with it, so we can't be afraid of change, we have to embrace change. And if that's a problem for us, then we have to change the thing that makes it a problem for us. Um, thou shalt not touch production. Lie. Absolute lie. Again, I don't own the game and I don't run it. The developers own the game. So why should I stop them being able to do the job and why should I protect the thing from its creators? It's nonsense. It's absolute nonsense. Um, we do everything correctly. We are a shining example of a hundred blog posts, as I'm sure all of the rest of you are. That's a complete lie. Of course, we screw a fair few things up. So um, I guess I sort of wanted to get more into how we organize ourselves in terms of the day-to-day -day things that we do. Uh, we have a, an operational repository uh, in which we have a, a gem bundle. Now, we um, have a strict rule that our operational language is Ruby. There's two reasons for that. I think, firstly, um, white spaces is syntactically um, significant element is the, the work of fools and evil people, honestly. <laughs> just pause for hecklers there, just carry on. Um, sorry, I didn't hear you. I wasn't that interested anyway. Um, so we have, a, we have a repo that we have a, a, an ops gem, uh, an ops, we have an ops repo that we have a gem bundle in. We have a, we standardize on Ruby as an operational language. There's a sort of serious reason behind this, for our sort of language wars aside is that we don't want to get ourselves into the situation where Dave's script isn't working and Dave's on holiday or Dave's been hit by a bus or Dave's got a hangover, right? I don't care if you like Python. I don't care if you want to rewrite Cat and Haskell. We're writing it in Ruby. And the reason we're doing that is so that everybody in the team can reasonably work and interchange with each other. Uh, the second reason is that we can get new people up to speed as ops people very quickly. So you can clone the re repo, you can run bundle install, and you're an ops person. Right? You, you have all the tools that any other ops person does. So that doesn't just help us when it comes to new hires. It helps us get other people within the organization acting as ops people. Because, again, there are no silos, and I've got nothing to protect from anybody. If, you're, if you've got the sort of nounce to get yourself in and want to become, uh, um, act like an ops person and use the tooling, then I want to make it as easy for you as possible because you're going to do things for me that are going to make everybody's life better, I think. Excuse me. We also try not to write ops code, uh, which is unfortunate that they, the configuration management company called themselves that, because I think ops code is a particular breed of code, and it's usually not very good. Um, so we try and do things, and this, this, this shouldn't be magic to ops guys, but it usually is. We try to do things like inheritance, and mix-ins, and libraries, and code reuse, and not copying, pasting crap about, you know. 
Um, so many ops guys have never had a formal education in development and tend to not write code that is maintainable going forward, is my experience anyway, as, as a contributor to that, I might add. Um, there are always dirty corners to ops. I forget the exact quote, but it's something like behind every web scale startup, there is a, a Perl script, right? Um, so you, you inevitably end up with lots of for loop shell incantations because whilst we all stand here and pretend that we don't do these things, we all do them, we all know that we do them. Um, so we have in our repo a file of shell helpers that if you're gonna make one of these magic back ticked um, bashes and uh, constructions, put it in there and commit it. So when everybody pulls, they get these things. If we're gonna do cheap and dirty hacks, let's not have 10 vers versions of the same cheap and dirty hack. Let's have one, put it in one place and allow everybody to use it. So one of the most important things to us is to make things visible. We use HipChat. HipChat's got a really nice SDK for Ruby. Probably has one for Python, I haven't looked. Um, and it makes it very easy not only to uh, do the sort of traditional uh, team and collaboration uh, chat type stuff, you can poke events into it. So it's very useful. One of, the, one of the greatest things about the way we work is that we can be sitting and be having a discussion and then promote perhaps some cookbooks up into production and see that happen interspersed as we're talking, or see the fact that someone's committed to some code, see the fact that someone's branched and done this, that, and the other. To be able to intersperse your operational events with you talking about them is both a brilliant audit log and a, a great way of maintaining visibility over a, a team that may be separated by time zones or maybe separated by geography or, or a hangover even, I don't know. Um, there's a load of obvious stuff as well on this slide. Graphs, log stash, dashing, graphs and log stash. I mean, yeah. Dashing dashboards, yeah. So we, I know it sounds a bit twee, but we've got dashing dashboards. Dashing is a, um, a, a dashboard development framework. I think it's from the guys from Shopify, and it makes it very easy to make dashboards that don't look horrible. Um, and just sort of lowering that barri barrier to entry to making availab information available, available, visible to everybody in the company has been a huge boon to us. Uh, we also, again, don't silo. So if you are a developer or if you're the CTO or if you're the CEO and you spot that something is wrong and you want to correct it, you're quite welcome and able and uh, encouraged to clone the repos, make the change and commit it. Um, if you're going to do useful things for me, you're probably not, and you're gonna take the time and effort to go and do useful things for me, um, I'm not gonna tell you not to do them because I'm gonna have to do them anyway, right? So there are some things that we like um, this is, I guess, a random collection of bullet points. Uh, there's a project called CFN DSL for CloudFormation. It is a Ruby DSL for CloudFormation. There are two advantages to this. Firstly, if you're using CloudFormation, so to be clear, CloudFormation is uh, basically a manifest system for Amazon EC2 accounts. It's a way of uh, encoding all of the services and the configuration of those services you would like in an Amazon EC2 uh, infrastructure and playing them into the environments they're coming to being. Firstly, uh, it enables you to do cloud formation without having your eyes bleed because it's terrible to write if anybody's ever done it. And secondly, it means that we can do code type things with cloud formation. So we can have um, classes that define a standard load balancer that we can extend. We can do all this. We can really do infrastructure as code as code, which I know is a bit meta, but um, it just means that I guess we don't sort of sit there with these sort of big, long, compig files. CloudFormation uh, stacks then become something you can execute and treat like code, which has worked very well for us. Uh, we like branching. I say that as an obvious thing. Uh, in my God knows how many years in this industry, um, source control to a lot of operational people has been the thing that you put things into when you don't want to lose them, and that's it. Um, if you don't properly understand how to use your source control, if you don't properly understand how to tag, branch, merge, that you shouldn't be using submodules in Git, for example. Um, if, you, if you have, you're probably sitting at home crying still. Um, if you don't know how to do these things, then you should, because if we're doing infrastructure as code, then we need to be able to use the tools to manage infrastructure as code. Um, just an aside, Elasticsearch clustering is great. Elasticsearch, uh, we use behind Logstash. It's brilliant. Uh, if you uh, you get a chance and you need some sort of Lucene solar indexy thing, go and look at Elasticsearch because I, I absolutely love it. But that's it. There's no other sort of fable, you know, sort of point that comes with that. Um, 
this is a big one for me. We studiously avoid using wikis. I hate them. The editors are terrible. Uh, and more importantly, um, if I change the documentation to reflect the state of things now, and then I need to roll them back to last week, then generally, I mean, if we're all honest, we don't roll the documentation back either. So we version thing, we, we version our documentation in Git alongside the things that the documentation is meant to describe. So if I then sit there working on a branch, I can update the documentation, and if the op, if the ops guys are called at 4 a.m. and they're working off the header master, which is our current live, then the documentation reflects that point in time. Uh, I think it's really important that with systems, particularly infrastructure as code, that you explain why you're doing things. The code explains the how, you should be explaining the why. So we have a huge emphasis on documentation, um, and we found this the best way to manage that with teams over time. Um, we also like unit testing, Chef. Um, again, there's been 30 years of software development experience as operations people or as DevOps people. We should learn from that. Uh, and making sure we don't regress changes in code over time is something that's been pretty much solved for God knows how many years now, and we should learn from people. So we love unit testing, Chef, and you should be doing it too. Things that we dislike. Are there any Chef users in the audience here? One, two. Wrapper cookbooks are the devil's spawn. So wrapper cookbooks is a paradigm where you go and download some code off the internet uh, that purports to do something, and then you then wrap it in another cookbook and use that. The um, advertised advantage of this is that you can very rapidly um, get a leg up, and you can also uh, track changes from upstream without having to take on the maintenance of a code base. In reality, it just doesn't work. The reason it just doesn't work is because there's very little standards in in the uh, community cookbooks. For example, one trivial example being there is no community cookbook standard for process supervisors. If I go and get the cookbook right now for my SQL, it will probably use supervisor D. If I go and get the cookbook for blah, invent something else, it will probably use upstart unless it's on CentOS, in which it will decide to do whatever it's going to do. Um, they're very good for getting up very quickly, but you'll find yourself backed into a corner. I can say this having worked on a completely bespoke chef code base of about 30,000 lines of code, managing many hundreds of servers with many uh, tens of thousands of unit test cases, and I can say that working on infrastructure that has been built with community cookbooks uh, and is proving to be a pain to maintain over time. Um, CloudFormation, if you're using it, does not have a dry run, run mode. In reality, once you get behind all the marketing bullshit and the blog spam and all that kind of thing, this makes it really hard to use into production because you can't determine what it's going to do ahead of time. Um, if by any chance this makes its way to any sort of Amazon product manager, please either uh, put a dry run mode in CloudFormation or give me some other way of comparing my expected end state with my expected running state now, please. Um, if you're using Graphite and you're using consistent hashing, um, that is very hard to scale. The way consistent hashing works with Graphite is that you decide that your Graphite, your graphite storage tier is going to be n number of node, nodes wide. If you want to upgrade that online without interruption, you're going to be out of luck, basically, uh, unless you go through a huge data migration exercise, which at which point you're not doing things online. So just if you're going to use Graphite, be aware that carbon cache um, requires some thought for horizontal scaling. Um, and lastly, DynamoDB. So DynamoDB is a, a, a key value store database that um, Amazon offers as, of, offer as a service. Um, it's great for its use case, um, not getting into the whole sort of SQL, no SQL war thing, but the tool chain is extremely weak, particularly the tool chain around um, managing scaling. Go in with your eyes open and uh, think very carefully before using DynamoDB. So I've got some parting thoughts on the whole um, DevOps thing. Um, beware of the bandwagon. It's it's great that we're all sitting and talking about this stuff, and it's it's really cool that there's a sort of coherent movement behind this thing. But ultimately, at the end of the day, we all need to get things done because some guys put it in a blog doesn't make it right. And there's a lot of stuff that isn't in blogs that's pretty interesting too. So if you're doing the right thing. Let's come to meetups and talk to each other and work out how we're going to do this thing that we're calling DevOps. Um, weak tooling will destroy a movement. So if you take a look at the DevOps toolchain that's public, 
well, the common DevOps tool chain that is publicly available. Um, my experience managing at scale over time is that a lot of the magic is very wide but very shallow. Um, and if we're really going to be serious about this whole DevOps thing as a movement, we need to up our game on the tool chain and make some of this stuff a bit more battle-hardened, I think. Um, when I say we're lucky to be an industry that lends itself to working in this style of working, I mean the gaming industry. We're very lucky that we are a uh, technology-focused uh, industry. We're very lucky that we have um, a high caliber of developer. Um, and we're very lucky that we uh, don't have to do things like PCI and all these other nasty things that um, perhaps would stop you working in this way. Um, so it's not for everybody. Just because there's some hype doesn't mean it's necessarily for you. So thank you very much for listening to me. If you want to get in touch, we are also hiring um, for ops guys. You can get in touch with us there. And please check out and install Samurai Siege. Thanks for listening. <laughs>